I'd like to welcome everybody to our How to Help Baby Wildlife presentation on the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series today. Uh, again, my name is Benji Cohn. And I think with that, we're just going to turn it over to Heidi, our non-game wildlife permit coordinator, and I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you. My name is Heidi Sear, and I am the non-game wildlife permit coordinator, and that means I permit um, falconry, research, rehabilitation, depredation, salvage, quite a number of things. And today's topic will be dealing with the rehabilitation. And so we have it broken down into how to help those baby wild animals just as a regular private citizen, and then how to help baby wild animals if you want to apply to become a wildlife rehabilitator. So um, if, if you've always been interested in becoming a rehabber, today's your day. You, you can find out how to do that. So first off, do no harm. Most baby animals don't need your help. They are um, they are there because their mom put them there. And so just because you don't see the mom doesn't mean it needs your help, such as baby bunnies. Um, if they're larger than a tennis ball, they're pretty much on their own. A rabbit can have about four clutches a year. So that's four batches of bunnies and they're within four weeks, they're out and on their own. And so you, you see a little tiny bunny and it may seem like it needs help, it doesn't. Squirrels um, at the base of a tree, even if it's been knocked out because of the a storm or because someone cut branches and those um, that batch of squirrels seems like it needs help, it probably doesn't. A mom squirrel has about three nests in various trees around. And so if you back off and keep your kids and your pets away, that mom will come down and transport her squirrel pups away into the, a different nest. And so the big thing is, you staying back will allow mom to come back because she might be off in a different tree chittering at you trying to draw you away from those babies. If you find a nest of birds on the ground, um, whether it's knocked out of the tree because of one reason or another storms often, you may be able to just put that nest right back in the tree if you can tell which tree it was and in an area near where it, it used to be. If the nest is falling apart, then you may need to put um, it in a bowl with some holes in the bottom for drainage, and then you can bungee cord it in. And again, try to get it somewhere near there in the crook of a tree in a, in a stable location. Do this quick, and the mom will probably come back. Not always, but, but generally they will come back. They may take about 24 hours sometimes to come back, so just because they don't come back right away doesn't mean that the nest is abandoned. The older the, the fledgling, fledgling birds, the more likely the mom is to stick with them. Now, if you find a fledgling bird down on the ground, which um, without any feathers on it, you can try to just pop it back into the nest. Again, do it quickly, use a, a towel or some gloves and just pop it in. Birds don't smell. That's, I, I, I know some people um, think that the, the smell of the human will keep the mom away. For birds, that's just really not true. The, um, you will make them abandon the nest if you hang around by the nest for too long. So you wanna do this quickly. Just pop the baby back in the nest and then get away. Sometimes the mom will keep booting the baby out of the nest. And if that's the case, it may be diseased or have something wrong with it that the mom knows that you don't. In that case, it might need to be taken to a wildlife rehabilitator. Now, if the bird has a bunch of feathers and it's um, looking pretty old, but it's still flopping around on the ground right below the nest, that's probably a bird that is learning how to fly. And a bird is not always successful trying to fly on its first attempt. It may um, flutter down to the ground, flap its wings, look like it's um, in need of help, but really it's just um, practicing testing its wings, trying to get some, some muscle strength in those wings, and mom will still feed it. It, it might take a week to get that baby back in the, the sky, but um, as long as you stay away and you keep your pets away, the bird's probably going to be fine. Now, a uh, bedded fawn is one that um, people often get worried about because they'll say, well, that, that fawn's been there all day and the mom, we've been watching and watching and the mom hasn't come around and we think we might need to take it in. Fawns, deer leave their fawns alone for long periods of time and, and they often only check on them just a couple of times a day you know as much as only two times a day and so the best thing you can do is just leave it alone 
and um, not track over to the fawn and definitely don't pet the fawn because a fawn is born with very little scent, little to no scent. And so you going around the fawn is actually adding scent. And so you can be more, do, you can be doing more harm than good. And uh, ducklings are another one that people try to rescue. Um, a mama duck with her little ducklings wandering through yards um, can seem like they are going to be getting into trouble. Um, but again, the mom is, is doing her best. And what you can do is stay back with you and your family, keep your pets away. If the birds are in the road, try to um, get some signage out there. If this is a common area for ducks to go through, you know, those duck crossing signs helps cars to realize that there might be some ducks going through. If you have some very high embankments on the side of the roads, you might be able to put a little duck ramp out there. So, you know, because uh, a steep embankment may be a bit of a cliff to a little duckling to get through. Um, but by and large, they usually can make it to the nearest pond. Uh, they, they don't usually go that far from the nearest ponds. So um, just keeping an eye, on, an eye on them will be um, help enough. If there is one little duckling that is a straggler and um, is falling behind, don't swoop in and grab it up and try to run after the ducks to save it because that'll just cause all of the other ducks to scatter. And, and again, you're doing more harm than good doing that. So if that little duckling is left behind, keep an eye on it. If mom comes back, great. If she doesn't and it is truly lost, you can try to take it over to where they have gone into the pond and see if they'll accept that baby back. If they don't, you may have to take that one into a reading. Um, and bats, usually you don't see the baby bat, but you um, might see a, um, a bat in the wintertime, either in your house, and, and that's just because it stayed in your house in the wintertime. Um, in that case, you want to take it into a rehabber. If it's outside and you see a bat in the wintertime, it might have um, white nose syndrome. And so again, that might be an issue that you want to take into the rehabbers. The best ways that you can help baby animals in the wild are keeping your pets away, you know, dogs, cats, that sort of thing. If you know there's a nest in your yard, you can um, sometimes put like a basket over the area to keep your dog out and stake it down and just have enough room so that the mom can get in, but your pet can't. If, um, if there's an issue with your dog in certain areas, sometimes you can just have a run. Uh, you know, baby animals are only in the area for a very small window, window of time, just for a month or two. So um, doing different things with your dog can sometimes just help keep the dog away and uh, allow those animals to move out of the area. Um, you can also make sure when you're mowing, especially in the spring, you look around your yard before you mow. Baby rabbits will be in clumps of grass which to you, you want to mow, but to them look like a nice area to, to um, have their litter. And so um, that's one of the areas that you may find some baby rabbits and, and you, you, you'll see them after you mow. Um, you can also remove the attractants for predators. That's both wild predators and the domestic ones. And that means just make sure your garbage is closed, your um, recycle and, and your um, mulching areas are free from um, predator attractants, like don't put meat in them and make sure that they get closed. For your bird feeders, they should be cleaned regularly and um, changed regularly. Bad food in the feeders can harm the birds, as well as um, not cleaning them regularly can cause disease. Since the birds are attracted to the feeder, they all hang out there. Disease can um, occur at feeders. So we recommend cleaning them about once a week as well as um, deer feeding bands are to help deer so that they um, don't spread CWD, chronic wasting disease. And so if you're in a, a feeding band zone, definitely don't feed the deer, but realize that if you do put out bird feeders, you may also be attracting deer and other animals as well. So you might wanna be mindful of what you're attracting to those bird feeders as well. So if you find a, an animal that you really think is um, needs rehabilitation help, it's bleeding and it has obvious injury, it has ribs showing, um, there might be insects on it, you know, uh, ants or, or worms or any some other bugs. Uh, they might be sitting next to a deceased parent. That's often on the side of a roadway. 
or, or in other areas. Um, or they might be alone outside for an extended period of time. And that's beyond, like we were discussing with the, the deer and some of the rabbits, um, you know, this, this would be over a day's time that they're out there. And, and if it's a deer, sometimes they'll get up, instead of just being bedded down, they will get up and start bleeding, uh, as in crying, around for their mother. That might be a sign that it is truly an abandoned animal and not just an animal that was left there by its parents hoping for its safety. And so if that happens, the first thing we want you to do would be to contact a rehabilitator before you pick it up or even go by the animal. Because um, we have some really great rehabbers here in the state and they'll help you determine if the animal is truly in need. They'll help you um, figure out the best way to pick up that animal. Everyone is different. I have a couple slides later on how to pick up the animals, but really that's that's such a one size fits all thing and, and each animal has its own unique issues. So it's best to contact them before you even pick that up. And then where to take the animal, because not all rehabbers can take in all animals. And so just because you find the closest rehabber doesn't mean that would be the best place to take the animal to. Now, um, we'll be putting the DNR rehabilitation site on in the chat. And so once you go on that page, you'll come to this page. And on the left-hand side, you see all of the different um, buttons to push. And in the middle, it says um, that, that you can uh, permitted wildlife rehabilitation list PDF. That's where you would go to find the list of the current rehabbers in the state. And um, it's organized by county. So that should help you figure out who might be closest to you. So once you decide that you're going to save that wild animal, do not put yourself in danger. It will help no one if you end up hurting yourself or getting someone else hurt by trying to save that wild animal. And so in a traffic situation, if it's a nice quiet area in the road, then yeah, you, if you pull off to the side, make sure it's safe, make sure that nobody's coming, you can possibly save that animal. If it's on the highway or an on-ramp or an off-ramp or a very busy section, don't get out of your car, don't stop, and, and don't try to save the animal yourself. You should be calling 911. If it's, an, if it's an issue that you think that the animal may be putting others in danger, um, I. My favorite example of this was one time I was I was on the highway, um, the interstate, and getting off on an off ramp, still kind of traveling at a, a good pace, coming around a corner, and all of a sudden it was it was goose Armageddon. There were dead geese, um, dying geese. People stopped. People running around the road trying to save these geese. And this was off an off ramp, where um, everyone was still coming. Nobody saw these people in the middle of the road a better thing that they could have done would have been calling 911 and letting the police know that there's a potential issue of, of danger. I didn't see anyone get hit, but wow, that was that was one of the scariest things I think I've ever seen. And I, the least scary was that another goose might be damaged. It was, it was all the people running around there. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to rescue something that we don't wanna have to rescue you as well. Um, and that's especially true for water and ice issues. For both of those, we do not res we do not um, recommend rescue, especially for ice. And you'll see this in the winter time, uh, late fall, early winter, when the the geese and the loons and the ducks should be leaving. Sometimes one gets left behind, and for one reason or another, it, it just doesn't know that it should be leaving. Whether it's um, it's sick or injured, it might be in water that's closing smaller and smaller and you have people watching it and getting very worried for this, this bird. However, getting out there yourself, it's thin ice, it's dangerous, it's just not a good situation. And often the um, fire rescue will help out in these situations and that's only because they don't want people trying to go out in these situations and get hurt themselves. And so these brave, um, firefighters usually, um, but it can be some of our conservation officers as well, will go out there and try to rescue them just to keep other people safe. And and to be honest, usually these animals have to be put down because by the time they can be caught in this situation, they are so far gone 
that they're not really salvageable. So not only did the animal get put down, but people were put in danger. So just keep that in mind when you want to rescue an animal that maybe you shouldn't. You know, pe um, animals do die in the wild all the time, and that it it happens. It's it's hard to see. I know hard to see, but um, it, it happens. And it's we would rather have you safe than than try to save one animal because the population at a whole as a whole is not in danger generally. Uh, that also goes with bites and scratches and disease. Uh, um, if you do want to try to rescue an animal, just be very mindful that the animal doesn't want to be rescued necessarily. You are a big scary predator who might eat them in their mind, and so they don't necessarily want you getting anywhere near them. So make sure you wear gloves and heavy jackets. And if you're going to be holding them, do it as little as possible and clean the the gloves and that sort of thing before you use them for other things because some animals are more um, carry more diseases than others that can be transmitted to humans. And so be mindful of that so that you don't bring that back to your children and your pets for that matter. There are some animals that aren't allowed for rehab. And so before you pick them up, there are a couple of them that you shouldn't be taking into rehab. That would be some of the big game species, except for deer and bear, um, like the moose, elk, uh, antelope, and caribou. Not that we run into them often, but they are there and, and they aren't for rehabilitation. The gray wolves, um, we don't rehabilitate them here in Minnesota, and that's because they can be habituated too easily. And a habituated animal is a very dangerous thing because it doesn't have the right sense against humans. And, and so um, a habituated animal cannot be released back into the wild because it's a danger to themselves and others. And then skunks. We don't allow skunk rehabilitation by statute and that's because they are a rabies vector animal. So once you determine that it's an animal that can be saved and it's a safe place to do it, um, for a small animal, we would recommend that you take a, a hand towel and pick up the, the animal either with the gloves and, and put the, the towel in the box in a lidded container with air holes. Now just remember, some animals can chew and so a cardboard box for certain animals may not be the best transport system, you know, especially like squirrels and that sort of thing. So just be a little cognizant, especially if you can't take it right away that the animal doesn't want to be there. It doesn't realize you're trying to help it and so may try to escape. So again, try to make sure that you're not doing more harm than good. For larger animals and, and some of the animals that are a little more dangerous, a better way to do it would be to put a transport box near the animal on its side and then gently push the animal in and, and with a shovel, particularly for some of the more dangerous animals that have the um, talons or the the beaks and claws and, and that sort of thing, so that you push it into the box and then slowly raise the box so the animal slides down the side, down to the bottom, and then you can put the lidded, lid with holes in it uh, on the top. Never do this if you feel it's dangerous. A again, we would rather have you safe than save one animal that will not change the population of animals as a whole. So if it's a dangerous situation, call the rehabber and talk to them before you do this. They might send someone out there or they might talk you through it in a better way because every one of these animals is different and, and um, we just want you to be safe. So once you do have the animal and you're going to be taking it into a wildlife rehabber, make sure you pay attention to where you found the animal because um, in Minnesota, we return all of the animals to the location that they were found after the wildlife rehabbers are done with them. And so that way, um, we don't overpopulate certain areas, you know, just because a rehabber is in one area, they don't release them by their house. So if you do live near a rehabber, that's one concern that you really shouldn't have is um, that they're releasing them all in your in your neighborhood. That's not true. They try to return them as close as possible in a safe location to where they were found. And we want you to transport the animals in within 24 hours of picking that animal up because it puts a lot of stress on the animal. And so in, in that same vein, 
we don't want you to pet the animal. Don't let your kids pet the animal and try not to interact with the animal as much as possible because it is stressful. It couldn't cause more harm to the animal. And other animals can become habituated. Certain animals are very prone to habituation. Like I mentioned, the wolves, you know, very few interactions might cause that, inter that animal to lose some of its fear of humans. And when they lose that fear of humans, they can become a nuisance animal and they can actually get harmed by other humans and the humans' pets when they don't realize that they should be acting like a, a, a scared animal and stay away from them. Um, for that box, you should have it in a nice dark area away from noises until you can transport it. And definitely, definitely do not feed the animal. Um, a lot of times you can do a lot more harm by feeding the animal than um, than the injury that the animal sustained, uh, especially some of these orphans where people try to give them cow's milk. Cow's milk is very tough on an animal system, and so it can cause a lot of damage, as well as um, if you know it's a predator, people try to give them ground beef. Again, that is very damaging to their system. Uh, if you ever go over to the raptor center, they have um, some of their education raptors and they have a couple of owls. And if you ever get to hear the story of some of the, their owls, some of them have been there because humans kept the owls and they tried to, to nurse them to, to health by giving them ground beef and they kept them for a couple of weeks. But by the time they got to a wildlife rehabilitator, those owls didn't um, produce the, the proper bones because owls eat their prey whole, bones and all. And then that calcium in their prey leaches out into their system and is is what they use to build their own bones. And so those poor baby owls never got calcium and so their bones were um, were malformed. And so again, within 24 hours, we just recommend getting the animal to somebody who knows how to take care of them. And that's the most important part. Now, if, if you want to become a wildlife rehabilitator, that would be great. We, we only have a limited number in the state. And so um, it's, it's a very interesting process to become a rehabber. And there are quite a few rules, but I know a lot of them find it very re rewarding. And so um, first and foremost, you can't possess any of the wild animals in the state without a, some sort of license or permit. And so to possess the rehabbed animals, you need a rehabilitation permit. And with that, you can capture them, receive them, possess them, transport, and that would be the orphan, sick, and injured animals. However, not everyone's cut out to be a rehabber. And so the biggest question is, should I be a rehabber? And you need to realize that the goal of wildlife rehabilitation is to release the animals back to the wild. It's not to save all of the wild animals. And that might sound sort of odd, but if you think about it, a wild animal that loses its, its, uh, one of its paws, or it can't fly properly, or it loses one eye, or it has um, a, a, an issue that it, it is fine, except that it's in pain for the rest of its life, or any of these things, you're not really saving the animal. You're just causing the animal to go back into the wild and probably starve to death. And so to become a wildlife rehabilitator, you really have to realize that, you know, if, if an animal can't survive when it's released, it probably needs to be euthanized. So this is a very different mindset than the domestic animal care, where, um, you know, the goal of, of domestic animal care really is to save all of them and to find homes for all of them. And, and so, if, if that's more your mindset, then maybe you should be doing the, the cats and dogs and leave the, the wild animals to someone who can kind of step back and say, is this the best thing for the animal? Because really only on very, very rare occasions can an animal that can't be released be sent to like a zoo or an education center. It's very rare. And, and that's because most of them don't make education good education animals. And most of them don't want to be in captivity. Once they were a wild animal, it's not a life they want. And so it, there's a lot of criteria for an animal that's wild to become an education animal. And this goes along with the habituation. Um, wild animals cannot, that are habituated cannot be released into the wild. And so if you become a wildlife rehabilitator, 
you are only able to handle them just as as little as possible and you shouldn't be using them as pets and 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 um, holding on to them. They must be in separate living quarters from where you and your family stay. And um, mammals should definitely not be anywhere near your household pets. Because again, um, habituated animals don't realize that they're a wild animal. And so they will come up to people, they will come up to dogs, which are a predator on them, and it, they won't survive in the in the wild. Some people who want to get a rehabilitation permit think that they'll be able to exhibit them and use them for education. And that's actually a totally separate permit. Um, education permits are for animals that are intended to be education animals. They aren't, they may be wild animals, but they may be um, bred animals. And so we usually don't allow a person to have both an education permit and a rehabilitation permit just because there is a, a conflict of interest sometimes. And so even if we do allow it, you usually can't transfer any of your rehabbed animals over to your education permit. You'd have to get them from somebody else's permit. So we really try to keep all of that separate to make sure the, the process stays um, as good as possible for the animal's sake. So if you are still interested, uh, I didn't scare you away, you can um, get a permit by uh, following these steps. And the first step would be to volunteer. That way you can work with a, uh, an established rehabber, find out the ins and outs, get some hands-on experience, see if it's even for you. And you also need to have a master mentor, which will be um, something on this list further down. And so getting within the community is a great first step. The next step would, to be, um, would be to get the study guide and the exam book. And um, the, right now, they're on this um, mngovpublications.com website. We're hoping to get away from that within a year, but for now, that's still the process. Uh, but we're hoping to upgrade the exam and the, the study guide so that we can get away from the, the $40 purchase set and so that there won't be a fee for any of the, the sets that you will need in the future. The final things you'll need are to send an application, obviously, and um, all of that will go to the non-game.permits email address, and um, that's the one that I see, and as well as getting an inspection on your facilities. And we make sure that the facilities stay up and um, to code all throughout. So, you know, just because you get inspected right in the beginning doesn't mean we won't check up on you later on. We want to make sure that all the facilities stay clean and in good repair. And then, as I mentioned, you'll need a master advisor. So doing that volunteer work is, is almost essential to being able to break into the community because the master advisor will be with you for two years. So it's, it's good to have a, a relationship before you get into that situation. And then um, a veterinary consultant. And a veterinary consultant, they don't need to have a permit. They can just be a regular vet in your community that agrees to help you with these rehabilitation animals. And um, a vet may uh, help a rehabilitator. They also may take in wild animals on their own and they can keep them up to 48 hours and treat them. And from there, they need to turn them over to a wildlife rehabilitator or notify a conversation a conservation officer that they have them in their possession. For a veterinarian, if they want to have a permit, they jump over novice class and go right to general class. There are three classes, novice, general, and then master class. It takes seven total years to become a master rehabilitator. And so that's the end of my presentation, but I know there may be some questions out there. And so I will open it up now for any of your questions? Great, Heidi, thank you. A lot thank of you. great information. I think the key takeaway we were chatting before, just try to leave them alone and keep yourself safe. I, I hate to see that, like you brought the example of people going on the ice and try to rescue even their dogs, but yeah. much less deer that's, or, that's another one. or other things. It's just be safe calling the professionals yeah. to do that and help you out. So well, hopefully we're all away from the ice today this, this year. So yeah, exactly. We always try to say, you know, just um, it, it's hard to see a wild animal suffering, but sometimes you just have to realize that 
it is nature and it and it happens and and that animal that dies um unfortunately for that animal it dies but it does become food for every other animal so you might be helping a fox or something else or or an eagle even out there finding its own food so as tough as it is to see it it may actually be better that you just leave it in place and let it go good information so we get a question the no skunk rehab because of the rabies vector, but aren't raccoons also re um, aren't raccoons also rabies vector animals? The raccoons often have rabies, um, and but they're not they don't stop it by statute. That's the difference between the skunks and the the raccoons. By statute, no one is allowed to rehabilitate them, and so. Okay. Um, for raccoons, most of our rehabbers, um, actually mo all of them, I believe, have get the um, rabies vaccine before they start working with the animals to protect themselves and, and make sure that they, they keep up with that so that they are protected. A lot of rehabbers um, specialize in certain animals and a lot of them don't take raccoons because um, not only do raccoons possibly have rabies, but they, they have quite a few other diseases or can have quite a few other diseases that can be transferred to humans. And so they can, even though they're adorable, that's actually one of the ones that are most habituated out there because they are just the cutest little things. Um, that's why they're also the most dangerous because they are so cute. People bring them into their homes, their kids play with them, not realizing that these adorable baby animals can be just as diseased as a big adult scary one. And so you shouldn't be snuggling them. You shouldn't let your kids snuggle them. They can cause harm. And they got teeth and claws, so. That too, sometimes, that too, yeah. Sometimes those come out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jody was asking, I think we got this in the chat, but is there a link on the DNR website to become a volunteer with a rehabber? What would no, you go about doing that? Um, you, you would just go to the, go back to the website and find the rehab facilities and contact them, just like you would contact them if you found an animal, contact them and see if they would be interested in having a volunteer. A lot of the rehab places, they um, they are always in need of rehab volunteers and they are usually very welcoming. I'm guessing a lot of those places are all volunteers too that yes. volunteer a lot of their time for them, so. Yeah, you know, uh, that's one thing you mentioned about, uh, about rehabilitation. You don't get money for being a rehabber. It's, it's a very altruistic um, venture. You, they usually get it through donations. They get their money through donations. So being a volunteer with rehabbers um, is, is one of the ways that they're able to do all of the things that they do, especially in baby season with these babies where they need sometimes 24 hour care. Uh, Jill has a question, not about rehab, but she has a wild grouse that has been coming up to us for the last year on some property we own. We don't feed it, but it keeps following us around. Suggestions on what we should do? I don't want to cause it any harm. Yeah, you know, this is this is what I talk about habituation. Somewhere along the lines, that grouse learned that people equal food. And so um, definitely, if you're feeding the birds, try to move it back or, or just stop feeding birds for a little while to get it to move away into a different area and realize that you're not a source of food. Um, you can also also maybe haze the bird a little bit, scaring it to make the bird realize that humans don't equal food. Because um, the biggest thing, you might be nice and you might not have dogs, but somebody else might not be as nice and, and they might have their dogs out there and they might have um, other things going on. And so that bird will be a danger. So the quicker it can realize that humans aren't a good source of food, the better off that animal will be. Great. We had for a few years, we have a small pond in our backyard that these ducks would fly in. And every time I see them, I'd run out or I'd send the dog out to scare them off the pond for that reason, because I didn't want them to have babies in our backyard because I didn't want them like be imprinted on us. Of course, the kids would probably be out there feeding them something too, but yeah. That's like exactly. Yeah. Keep them out of our yard. So, uh, Kathy, if, if you see a hurt eagle, who should you call first? We won't give out Lori's phone number for this one either, right? 
No, uh, the Raptor Center is the best one um, because most rehabbers will take them to the Raptor Center, whether they accept it themselves, they usually end up transporting it to the Raptor Center. So um, a hurt eagle is usually going to be sent to the Raptor Center in one way or another, and they may have some of their volunteers that go. Um, there's a, an extensive, amazing network of transporters in the state that just run around all over the state grabbing up some of these animals and transporting them for the rehabbers. And the Raptor Center has some great transporters too. So they may send some out or they just may recommend going to one of the rehab centers and taking it in. So I would call them first. Okay. And handling as well, because they're obviously very dangerous. And so they can give you some tips as well. Hopefully that's, yeah, if you see one, call somebody to come help. Yeah. Don't go try to get it yourself. So. Definitely not, yeah. Uh, Carol was asking, is it helpful to build bird houses, butterfly houses, et cetera, to help wildlife? They can be, um, and, and definitely you wanna make sure that you're going to like a, a reputable place on, if you wanna get a blue bird house, some of the, the plans, because certain birds that you want to help you may actually be doing some harm like bluebirds where other birds may come in there. And so there are plans out there to be very species specific. Now, if you have a very, you know, you don't really care what you get, you just want some out there, then, um, you know, you, you can have a much wider ranging birdhouse, but cleaning them out in the spring is always good. Like I mentioned, disease is an issue. Cleaning your bird feeders out in the spring and then weekly is, is an issue. So um, as well as, if you have cats, make sure that your your cats are um, away from the bird feeders. They they can, as as much as we love our pets and everything, they can be a danger to all of these wild animals. I was just looking for a book. I know there's a book called Woodworking for Wildlife. They have some great plans. Yep, by Carol stuff. Henderson, um, and yep. that one is a great one. It tells you plans on, um, oh, pretty much any animal you want to know, it even has information on how to do an osprey nest platform. So if, if you know you have osprey in the area, people have put up platforms from that book too. Good information. I'm going to throw that in the chat in just a minute. Um, should, should dead eagles on the road be reported? Are their feathers valuable for First Nations and others? And there's, this yes. is kind of a touchy one, so. Well, the, the eagles go into the eagle repository. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you bring the eagles in and you can take them into the DNR, but what we end up doing is we send them over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for the eagle repository. And so then that, that goes into um, for tribal ceremonies. And, um, and, and so then they petition to get them from there. So uh, we don't really have a lot to do with the eagles other than we'll ship them off over to the eagle repository. So if you see one, don't go grab feathers off of it because that's not good. You can't keep those. Uh, they're, the feathers are federally protected. So yep. and technically you would be breaking federal law doing that. Um, and, and actually most of them are just because back in the day with women's hats and that sort of thing, they used to kill them for the feathers. And so they had to start protecting them for their feathers. And so if you do yep. find wild animals and their parts, just realize those parts are still protected even though that animal might not be alive, you technically can't collect all of that. That's that's where I, I mentioned that some of my permitting comes in, salvage permits are a permit that you would need to get to collect dead parts and pieces of animals. Oh yeah. It, this person was said they do some highway cleanup and wondering what to do with dead wildlife. I don't, I'm not for sure if there is a, do you know if there's a statute what to do with if you're doing highway cleanup and find dead wildlife along the road? No, but um, one of the big things I would recommend is moving it off into, um, you know, at least 10, 15 feet off of the, the highway, just because um, it's it's an attractant, especially to those eagles. Eagles will come, you know, to a deer or, or other animals on the road and, and as well as crows and all the rest, but eagles in particular get hit on the highway because they come for the deer carcasses. And so if you uh, are a county who can do that sort of thing or, or you know, any other area, it's great if you can move those carcasses off roadways to protect the other animals. Great. See, 
uh, Jody put in the Q and A. The woodworking for wildlife is currently out of print. I believe that's true. Um, I believe the Iowa State University still does some of that. This link I threw in there, but you can find it at used bookstores once in a while too. So you search the. Might be the something that we have to email Carol Henderson about. He he used to be uh, work for the DNR and and uh, he was yep. wonderful at at giving advice on this. And Carol, if you're if you're interested too, Carol has done a moss program for us in the past. So if you look in the past programs, I'm not sure off the top of my head what program that was, but he has done a couple on uh, backyard habitat for birds and stuff. So there's some great information out there for that too. So. All right, I th I think that's all we got for questions in here. Unless anybody sees any in the chat. Um, again, it's that it's that time of year where we're starting to see a lot of baby wildlife out there. And uh, people, I'm sure you guys your, or yourself and wildlife rehab places get a ton of calls on this. So thank you for sharing really all do. this great information, and we can refer people to this and uh, go from there. Wonderful. So, all right. I think with that, we'll stop the recording and we'll head back to the back room. Hopefully, everybody can join us next week. We're talking to uh, Kitty Lynn about butterflies, monarch butterflies. So, that's going to be a, a super interesting pro uh, topic, also. So, see you next week. Have a safe weekend.